You are listening to the David Cassidy Connections with your host, Louise Poynton. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 38th episode. I'm your host, Louise Poynton, and I'm thrilled today to welcome my guest, Jay Grusker. Jay is a songwriter, composer, and producer. He has been responsible for some of the best-loved themes for film and television, including Charmed and Supernatural. He received an Emmy nomination for his soundtrack to the television series Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Jay is also known for co-writing the hit duet Tell Me I'm Not Dreaming for Jermaine and Michael Jackson and What You're Missing by Chicago. Jay wrote for and with David Cassidy. He explains David's contribution to I Never Saw You Coming, written by Jay with Billy Moomy and David Jolliffe. This appeared on David's Getting It in the Street album. Jay worked on that album, and they later co-wrote the theme for the Man Undercover television series in which David starred. Jay was also composer, co-writer, and music producer on the popular but short-lived sitcom created by David's half-brother Sean, Ruby and the Rockets. We cover a range of subjects in our conversation, but I started by asking Jay about retirement. You once said that you did not believe in retirement. <laughs> well, I, I, still, I still feel that way in the sense, at least for, I don't know, at least for, no, I don't want, even want to categorize it. I suppose there are some professions where it's just official that you would retire because you either age out or, or you just physically can't practice anymore. I think as a songwriter and as a composer, and as a sort of a music creator for my whole life, it doesn't compute that I would just stop doing that. But um, in a sense, this year, and certainly the pandemic, the first year of the pandemic was a challenge for all of us. I have stopped working at the thing that I've done for the last 30 years, which is scoring film and TV shows. Not, not so much like I made a decision. Um, oh, I'm not gonna do this anymore but some combination of the phone hasn't rung as much as it used to. And that I was a little, a little burnt out from the deadline existence. Um, You know, I started as a songwriter and the, the sort of concept and process and agenda there was the song was finished when the song was finished. Whereas writing a, a score for a movie or a television series, if the score is due next Thursday, there's no excuses. You have to have it done. And so, um, you know, that pressure became just a part of the muscle. Uh, It didn't even feel after however many years, like pressure as much as this is what needs to get done. And um, I would say the only drawback um, to that, because that's also kind of exciting, is that it forces you into merging inspiration and craft um, you know, those two aren't always necessarily, you know, part of each other. So that was, a, that was an interesting experience, but, but the, but I do a long winded way of saying, I do not miss the, the deadline pressure, even though it wasn't that pressurized. So, and an even more long winded way of saying, so I'm, I still believe that as certainly as a creative person, and I think everybody has to bring some form of creativity to the to their work. I I I I, I would guess. I know that that's how I would view. You know, if I was collecting people's rubbish, I mean, I would figure out some interesting way to do it. Um, uh, so I don't think you ever really retire from from a creative mindset, but um, I think I've retired from hustling work, which I've done for you know as a freelance person for my whole life. And I've been fortunate that I that I can do that um, financially because I have a royalty stream and all that. What's the process that you go through when you're writing a TV theme, as an example? Do you get given a copy of the script? When it comes to thematic, to writing a theme, um, you not only have a script, but sometimes you even have a rough cut of a pilot, or if it's a television movie, the movie, and then also discussions the all important discussions with the filmmakers, which in television tends to be more the producers and in feature films tends to be more the directors. Point being that whosoever candy store it is, 
that's where that's who you're serve that's what you're serving you know and part of the job also if someone is not let's say musically literate in terms of description you know i think a composer's or songwriter's job is to interpret what that means because sometimes it can be sometimes it can take a minute to take a non musical though astute mind interpretation of what they want and and go oh okay i i i think i see what he or she is saying here and what the words that described it don't necessarily always match what the intent was and i'm talking about someone that maybe doesn't know how to communicate musically or the process is is basically um once again unfortunately in television time and deadline related more often than not so like for instance um one of the themes i wrote which was a tv series back in the 90s called lois and clark the new adventures of superman a uh, very fun project to do just because i had never worked in that area first of all to be in that pantheon the superman you know world was was a, an honor and and super fun um but i was given a week to write that theme and um and that's not unusual that's not unusual by the way um give or take some days and maybe some circumstances where someone is told about it a few months before it's needed but in the in the time table of that particular project i was given a week and i guess the 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 amusing though terrifying at the time footnote is that one of my favorite movies was the first superman film that john williams scored uh you know as geniusly as he's done everything if that isn't a hint to who i idolize yes and I'll elaborate further later um and I was in the shadow of that for the first two or three days I I couldn't write a note because I just you know I just kept thinking about that score and 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 the two or three main themes from that score and the love theme from that score and and I was just frozen <laughs> I just I couldn't uh, you know I just thought oh you know that that self judgment <clears throat> before you even write a note or a word or anything i did read a review where someone wrote that john williams and would just let people know that he is your ex father in law mm-hmm. his composition of the original superman theme was regarded by this reviewer as the best but they said that your score pinpointed the high flying adventures of what the film was all about well that's interesting i I've, i've never i've never read that listen i mean i i i never expect to even be mentioned in the same breath as him and i and i love him and uh, i mean he's no longer my father in law i mean i i he hasn't been for 25 years but but just you know you know get along great and we always did and um you know i went to all of his sessions for about 15 years the ones you know, not the ones in london but the ones that were scored in los angeles i went to a, a bunch of them and you know it was university for anybody just sitting in a room and watching a master like that you know once i was his son in law let's put it that way which was it starting around 1983 i felt brave enough to um actually i was a little braver the year before we got married because i asked him if i could um you know go to one of the sessions and um i went to my first session was et and um phew, i think i might have described this to you before it had a i mean it had a double impact on me one is this is beyond human capability to write music like this and completely inspiring and uh and motivating and then on the and and then the next thought was i shouldn't be doing this <laughs> um but um so yes i i went to you know a lot of the scores that he did in los angeles for i don't know over a decade yeah and that was um thrilling every time so after about 3 or 4 days after about 3 days i just finally went all right uh if i'm going to fail gloriously you know it's like anything you know an empty page you know it as a as a right you know 
and an empty page is, is so daunting. And then you, the first word on there suddenly becomes the, the, the view in. And I, and, um, and, and I got very lucky because I, I wrote two themes um, on that third or fourth day. And um, one of them didn't pass my own muster. So I never even submitted it. And I just submitted the other one. And other than a few notes, um, you know, I just got very lucky and it got accepted. And then, you know, I had to, you know, I had an Emmy nomination for it and it was a lovely experience, but it was born of it's due in a week. <laughs> so, so, um, I think there's a little part of me that, although I, I guess, you know, grouse about it and resent the, why do I have to do it that quickly? I also, I guess I kind of like the, the part of that process that it forces me into, because even though it sounds like I overthought it in the, for those first three days, once I got going, it was just developing it and, and not too much self-judgment. And so that's, that's the, I guess, the upside of, of having that, that time pressure is that you, you just don't have the luxury of loving every note you write. So that's a bad thing, but also it's a good thing because sometimes that self-judgment is what gets in the way of finishing something. As a journalist, if you're under pressure to suddenly turn around a breaking story within 10 minutes, and normally you'd sit there and you'd think about it and you'd ponder it. Right. You've got to do it. Of course. You've got your subs, your, your sub-editors crying out for the copy. You just do it. And it's amazing how sometimes that can turn out for a journalist or for a songwriter such as yourself, some of your best work. That's exactly, I mean, you, you've just summed it up. That's really, you know, you, you, you get, you're surprised yeah. that, it, that it happened. I'm surprised every time I finish anything anyway. So I think that answers the question of what the process is. And, um, but, um, you know, that it entails a certain sensitivity to either what the script says I prefer seeing images than reading a script because the script puts you in a space where you're making your own movie. Whereas if I'm seeing what the director and the lighting and the pace of the actors and the facial features of an expression and, and, and the rhythm of a scene and, and things like that, that tells me much more who, what I'm serving then if I read a script as, as illuminating as that can be, and, and certainly necessary for storyline and, and um, intent and all that. But um, for me, images, um, when they're possible, is certainly in film scoring, maybe not as much for a theme, for a television theme, you know. Had there been any particular unknowingly influence from classical composers that led you into film composition? Oh, I think, yes, certainly that, certainly that, but not necessarily in those formative years. I think even though my mother listened to just about everything, she was sort of the source of musical variety, let's, let's say, uh, in terms of what we heard in the house. I would say, though her tastes in classical ranged toward the more pop classical, the Tchaikovsky's and, and and the more lyrical and melodic, and not necessarily things that I would grow to like more later that are a little deeper, whether it was a Debussy or or Rachmaninoff or uh, things that just appealed to me as I sort of became more interested in my teen and college years in listening to a wider range of things and and uh, harmonic complexities that she wasn't necessarily drawn to. So it may have planted a seed, but I think it just got developed more and more later. And then of course, film music itself um, was what became interesting to me. Uh, you know, it's all music to me. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it really is. I mean, even the simplest little song on a guitar can move me the same way as 120 people playing a brilliant composition in a room you know arguably more details going on for the listener i i, I would say that 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 the uh the tilt into film music happened more as a young adult and young man in my 20s uh 
with a tiny seed planted early on, but the seed had more to do with listen to everything. And, and obviously, so, you know, not everything is going to move you or appeal to you even. I learned early on, and especially once starting to be more involved in film composition, you have to have an open head about every style and every idiom because you may be called on to do that tomorrow. And so even if it's not something that exists in your bones, there, there, you need to find a connection to it, your own connection to it. And that's all obviously all obviously scary, but it's also uh, wonderful and challenging. And, and you know, I call, I call it walking the plank. You know, you're walking the, the plank every time out, really, when it's not a, when it's not a style of music that, you've, that you feel 100% comfortable in, let's say. Did you find it easy to adapt to different film scores? It's a good question. I don't think I ever found it easy. But I, after however much period of frozen in fear, whether that was a few hours or a few days, as I described to you earlier, I was immobilized for three days when I had to write that theme for Superman in the early 90s. Uh, and that was just really, uh, but that was just the inner critic saying, oh, well, look at where the bar is here. So you'll never even come close to that. And, you know, if one listens to that voice, one never will do anything, right? Uh, and yet that voice is there for all of us, any of us that start with the blank page. Which music has moved you the most? Oh, uh, gosh. Well. Something that you've written or something composed by somebody else? Oh, it's almost always composed by someone else. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I might secretly have a thing or two that I, that I still love hearing of my own and that I'm proud of, but I would never admit that. <laughs> uh, I mean, mostly, mostly really, I'm just, you know, intrigued and impressed and, 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 and emotionally blown away by so many other things. And, you know, in, in the popular context, it, it of course started for me with the Beatles, still does, still does. The, those seven or eight years of the output of that group of people was still to me untouched on so many levels and then of course there's um you know the whole classical idiom is always mind-blowing but then you know in terms of film composition you know we go back to to, to john um you know you know i was uh john williams and i was for three or four years before i even met him or anyone in his family i was astounded by that work and that was Oddly, even in the beginning, that was Jaws and Close Encounters and the first Superman. He had done many other things, but those three things were just captivating to me in terms of the depth of writing, uh, how, how to be at once melodic and lyrical, but also completely glued and serving the images and heightening the images. As I told you once before, if you want to make this whole podcast about my uh, fandom of John Williams, it could easily go there. But I know we're here to talk about David, and, uh, and that's fine too. Jackson Brown once said, good songs stay written. Do you agree with that? I never heard that quote. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting expression. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, they, they stay written, but I imagine they live for years with you. Yeah, and, and I suppose there's never been a composer or songwriter that doesn't occasionally reflect on even their best songs or compositions and, 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 uh, and think, oh, uh, you know, I wish I had done this chord variation or melodic variation. Or I know that for sure, like performing artists, you know, singer-songwriters, which I used to be, but, you know, when you go out, uh, you, you might make a record of, 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 of freshly minted songs, but then you go out and perform them in front of people and they inevitably take on new colors and shapes and contours and, and variations uh, from improvis improvisatory moments and things like that. And then suddenly six months later, you go, oh, if I had only understood this when I did the original. But um, maybe that's a different uh, aspect of, than what the quote that you just said. But uh, yeah, I think that's, I think I would agree with that. I mean, uh, I know that um, I quite often look back on work 
And even if I'm somewhat satisfied with, with something I did, I might think, oh, you know, I wish that little moment was improved with my current sense of judgment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I met David through mutual friends. I had done a little solo album in around 1974. And it's quite possible that I met David either, I don't think I had even met Sean yet, but David Jolliffe, who you and I have discussed, I was friendly with, and either David introduced me or Jerry Beckley, who was the lead songwriter and one of the singers in the band America, might have introduced me. And not too long after that, I think within a couple of years, you know, Jerry and David were co-producing uh, David's record, of which, you know, I happily, you know, we went up to a ranch called Caribou Ranch in, in Colorado, uh, the whole band and those guys. And I, it's amazing we got any work done because it was just so beautiful up there and horses and, you know, I mean, but um, that, that's, that's what I, I can't even tell you exactly, but I think that's, it was either David Jolliffe and the whole circle people because I was I was yet to meet Sean I hadn't met him for another few years because he was all of 15 around then but uh yeah the David and I and we just you know got along instantly and um you know I was in awe of the intensity of of his, what his fame was just a few years prior I mean and and so that took a minute to just sort of weed through that and see, oh, there's a good soul there and, and he's funny and, and bright and, um, and, and knew what he wanted. When you were invited to work with him on the Getting It In The Street album, yeah, um, what did it mean to him? I think it represented him officially breaking out of the Partridge persona um, and, and I think, you know, I think later in life, he appreciated those songs too. But at, in that moment, he wanted to explore more, uh, more liberated rock, pop rock expression. I don't want to confine it with, with badly perceived words on my part, but um, I think it, it represented, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. And I'm just going to do it. And, and that was the spirit of, of the whole process of pre, pre-production, going up to Caribou Ranch. And then I, I, we did some overdubs here in Los Angeles. And what I got from him was that um, he didn't want to feel boundaries of where he could go. And so if a song required a jazz saxophonist to come in, that's what he wanted and if the song was more of a rocking song and that's what he wanted it was about i mean so he you know i i respected that i liked it and he made it fun it was fun people have told me that during the partridge family days he was very much a one take recording artist interesting not surprising i think that um yeah um, I don't remember. I mean, uh, I, I, let's put it this way. I don't think he slaved over doing his vocals on that record. I think that the whole, that the whole thing I just described about him just wanting to feel natural and feel who he was, um, you know, and he had such a distinctive, cool sound. And it got even, I, I liked it later years also because he got a little more gravelly. And I like the, uh, the vintage nature of that. I liked it a lot. I, I liked the the gravelly fogginess uh, uh, component of his voice. I loved that little, you know, that little, not quite the full Rod Stewart, but just a little bit of that that gravelly com- component. I just thought was a really fantastic side of his voice. But he also had croony range. Uh, um, but as a singer, um, what I liked about David singing was that um, you got his heart, you got his who he was when he sang. It wasn't put on in some way that was a persona per se. Maybe some of that went on with the Partridge family singing, but I don't think so. I think that you got David there 
And I, I always appreciated that. And, um, you know, we sang in tune. <laughs> so as a musician, I, uh, I always appreciate that. And, um, and I loved his tone. I can't offer much bigger compliment than that. I can't personally say I saw him do something in one take, but I'm completely not surprised at that kind of thing. He wanted, um, he wanted real and he wanted um, spontaneous. But, you know, there was, there was rehearsal and there was figuring details out, but he, he wanted to capture spontaneity. And Do you know what it meant to him to work with Jerry Beckley and with Mick Bronson? I think he wanted to work with people that were like-minded, but also I think it was important for him to be able to hang, to hang with someone not just if they had chops in their area, not just if they were a good songwriter or a good musician or a good producer or whatever. He wanted the, the interpersonal component was important to him. And that was just very obvious. How did you come to write the song on the album? Yeah, so that's an interesting story that I don't think people know. I mean, that song was originally written by Bill Mooney, David Jolliffe, and myself. And then uh, I forget what the process was, but at some point I must have played, either played it on the piano and sang it for David, or maybe there was a little demo. I don't even remember. And he liked it, but had some additional thoughts on it, other thoughts on it. And um, so we ended up working it that way. Yeah. I don't even remember if the record has all four of us credited. I seem to remember it was incorrectly done at some point where it was just David and I credited, but really it was it was four songwriters on that, which was unusual. Now it's not unusual to see a list of nine people credited on a song. But in those days, it was one or two people and sometimes three. Um, but um, yeah, so that was, that was how that worked. David, um, you know, changed a, a batch of lyrics and then we changed one or two little musical moments and you know to sort of adapt it to who he was Mm. were there other songs which you wrote which you thought this would be a good song for him frankly no Um, i might have played him something else but that was the one that he gravitated to and he had most of the material ready for the record so there weren't there wasn't a lot of room and I, I, I think he invited me in there as a songwriter, as a form of camaraderie and welcome. And let's, let's dive right in this way. And um, that, that was, that's my sort of cell memory of it. I, I don't have an actual moment of recollection, but I just remember that that was what it felt like, was that, you know, this is how we're, this is how I'm gonna, we're going to get to know each other better. Let's go in and, and parse out and, 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 and make this song feel like it's right for me. And so that process always, you know, is very revealing. It either shows that two people should be much farther apart than they are or can get closer. <laughs> I think there were a few things we did that didn't, that didn't make the record, if I recall. But, um, you know, that's like we discussed. I, I was there. I, I, I was there, but I can't prove it. (laughs) Where do you rate him as a record producer? I don't think he fancied himself a record producer, even though his general um, knowledge base and knowing what he wanted and knowing when he thought something was good, you know, I mean, that's the primary criteria for being a record producer. But I don't think he fancied himself as as one uh, you know I, I i can't rate him there because um that's that's not that's not a place he lives were you d- disappointed and did you know if he was frustrated at the lack of promotion that the album received i mean i was pretty young at the time also uh, so i didn't i mean i was just maybe a couple of years in the business at that point in in proper music business I, I wasn't um, acutely aware, but I, I, I just know that that it really represented who who he wanted to be as this transition into 
just David Cassidy proper as a recording artist. And, you know, I, we were all, I think everybody was a little disappointed that it didn't make a little more noise. I mean, Jerry, Jerry Beckley was, was, was so hot at the time and, uh, you know, one hit after another from America and, uh, and David was coming off of, you know, that kind of notoriety and, um, and all the musicians involved were all, you know, in, into it and dedicated. And so it's always disappointing, but it's also part of reality. Not everything comes out there and, and, and does a thing. But yeah, I think the record company could have done more. And I don't know the specifics politically or otherwise as to why it wasn't, um, it wasn't promoted more. Is it, though, on reflection, perhaps easy for people to dismiss David Cassidy because he was a teen idol? Sure. That is the devil's bargain of teen idolism. Um, you know, I suppose in some ways it happened to Sean too, but Sean had a remarkable, I'm very close to Sean as we speak. I, I, I hold him in high regard as a friend and as a person who brilliantly reinvented himself because often the stigma of teen idolism is a hard one to break out of, you know? And, you know, David, you know, David, didn't he, other than, you know, his dabbling and being an actor in on Broadway and some other projects, you know, and I had that, that stint in, in Las Vegas for a few years. I think that was a successful thing for him. He was, he was a singer, songwriter. I mean, that's, that's, that's what he was. He, I don't think he ever, that I know of, tried to necessarily embark on another profession the way that Sean became a bona fide screenwriter, you know, and and an executive producer of, of television shows, which he's done wonderfully. So yes, that is a hard, that is a painful. I mean, look, you're given this, <laughs> you know, you you make a lot of money, you get all this fame and you know, tons of attention, and then it can turn around within five years of like. Who are you? You have no credibility. You, you know, my daughter liked you when she was 11. She's 17 now and has long past who you are. So that is the pitfall of that. I think David, I think he spent a lot of his life trying to get more of a credibility as an adult than, than what that was when he was younger. And I think that's not unusual, you know. But, and I don't even look at it as a sad story. To me, it's not a sad story. I mean, there were challenges, but everybody has them. And so that's a pretty high level uh, challenge, if you ask me. I mean, not high amount of challenge, but well, I suppose you could look at it that way because if you get that kind of adulation as a young person, and then it kind of goes away, although I don't think it has ever gone away for either of them for, with their base fan base as you are proving in this very moment it's um yeah that's uh that can't be an easy thing i've never been through it i've witnessed it from you know a relative distance but ultimately for me i don't know what that must be like but it's it's i'm sure it was hard how did you come to write for the likes of michael and jermaine jackson bet midler chicago I had a publishing deal with um, Screen Gems, um, which is now owned by Sony, as so many things are, for a decade. Um, I was a staff songwriter. And what that meant, I mean, those, that, that kind of thing still sort of exists, but not quite the same way as it used to, which is, um, you know, sort of, a, uh, if you were a staff songwriter, you might get a call from 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 the publisher saying, well, um, so-and-so is starting their third record and they have most of the material, but they need two cuts and they need a ballad or uh, they really need an up-tempo, da-da-da. You know, some kind of vague description. And, and more often than not, I found that those kinds of assignments, as it were, were somewhat futile only because you were 
unlike writing for a film, a song for a movie or a song for a theatrical musical, where you have the very specific parameters theoretically for style and, 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 and what you need to do, theoretically. Um, you know, when you're writing for an artist, even if you've been giving a, a description, it's challenging. It's, it's happened. It's happened a couple of times to me. I know it's happened to many songwriters on a huge level. But in my own experience, where I had success, where I had a few hits, was just songs that I sat down to write with a collaborator. And let's just write a good song. And here's, here's what today brought. Maybe somewhere in the process, one might say, ooh, this could really work for so-and-so. But um, there's no way to know that. Um, in my experience, um, and I think it has to come, you can have an artist in mind because you can picture he or she singing it. You're, maybe you're writing it for that voice. Um, but uh, it still comes down to, I mean, there's so many stars that have to align for an artist to record someone outside of their spheres song. You know, so many stars have to align. They have to like the music. They have to like the lyric. They have to like, it has to match where they are in their career right then. They have to have room for it on their record if they haven't already uh, um, amassed all of the songs that they're going to need. Uh, that's stage one. Stage two is, do they then record it and perform it? And does it cut? Does it make the final list? And there's, I don't know, three or four stages. Then stage three is, uh, okay, it's going to be on the record. Is that, is it going to be a, a single is it going to be anything that anybody notices. Does the record company agree? I mean, there's so many, so many crazy stars that have to align for what we all take for granted as the plethora of hit songs that we've all heard in our lifetimes. There's a gigantic, you know, encyclopedia of stories about the evolution of each one of those things. You know what I mean? And so, um, how did I get to do it is a long-winded answer again, is that I was a staff writer and often um, I would either be put together with someone or a, a, a producer, which is always a very strong way to be invited into writing for a project is if the producer of that project or the artist especially somehow here's something you did, wants you to write another one, whatever. So in terms of the Michael and Jermaine uh, song, that was uh, the, the record producer and songwriter, Michael O'Mardian is how you pronounce his name, brilliant man, um, asked me to get involved and, and, and write that song. And then for Bette, uh, for Bette Midler, which are the, the one song that Paul Gordon and I wrote for her, I had played for her in her house because she had heard a handful of my songs, I don't know, five or six years before that came up and, and um, through my publisher and then invited me to her home when she lived in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, I just played her a handful of songs. And even though she wasn't making a record at the time, there was one song that she remembered. I don't know, it was probably five or six years later. And I got a call about it. So it's it's a really kind of every every way possible that those things can can happen. And then, you know, some other songs were just I sat down to write with with uh, someone. I mean, as a matter of fact, um, a song that was on a Chicago, a very big selling Chicago album, Chicago 16, that I, that David, it was the first one that uh, David Foster, producer, great producer, um, did on them. It's a song that I had written with Joseph Williams, John's son, who is the first Williams I met, who ultimately a year later introduced me to his sister, who I ended up marrying. But that was no, we had no one in mind for that. But that was just, hey, let's get together and write a song. And then a year and a half later, it sold two and a half million records. You know what I mean? So in the days when people used to sell records like that, other than Adele. Who, who is still doing uh, that kind of stuff. And I was of moderate success. I mean, there were songwriters that were, you know, just, you know, look at Diane Warren, you know, I mean, just incredible amount of output and just her whole life was just, you know, pushing the songs and 
getting them recorded with the right artist and then you know all those stars aligning multiple times but that's basically how it was for me which is that i had a publishing deal and they're the ones that sort of scanned the horizon and said oh here are some of the projects that are brewing i'm not sure how much that exists anymore i think it does a little bit not as much as maybe it did in the 70s and 80s can you remember the first song that turned out far better than you thought it would have done? Uh, I would say the Chicago record and uh, the Michael Jackson recording turned out fantastic. I had a very big hit in the mid to late 80s called Friends and Lovers. And I, I don't know if it, I don't think it was ever, I don't think it made it over to, you know, England, but um, it was a very, very big hit in the United States. But it was it had an anomalous situation, which is two artists had a number two record in the U.S. pop and number one adult contemporary. It was another kind of chart, more of an easy listening kind of chart. That record was number two pop and number one AC. But at the same time, there was a country hit version of it with uh, Eddie Rabbit and Juice Newton. And that was number one country so that was a complete fluke and i loved their version wasn't that big a fan of the other one to be honest but you can't complain too much when you have a song that's a hit but maybe you don't love the way it turned out you still you learn to you learn to like it a lot more but the country one was really impressive to me the arrangement and the musicality of it so yeah i think you know those handful of, of, of things that I guess turned out not necessarily better, but as good as I would have hoped, because often things can be disappointing. Because you also wrote a couple of songs for Three Dog Night. The, their claim, those couple of songs claim to fame are, they might be the only two songs in their repertoire that weren't hits. <laughs> they were, they were the very, that was the very beginning of sort of the <laughs> I'm getting some songs on, uh, you know, other people's uh, records. And uh, because they were a band that didn't do any of their own songwriting. Phenomenal sort of vocal group, you know, and arguably the biggest band in the world for three or four years in the, in the early 70s. A couple of my songs were heard and, you know, they were recorded and, you know, they turned out OK, but it's not their fault. I, the songs weren't that good. They were just OK. For me, it was like, OK, here's the beginning of seeing what it's like. And, you know, because at that point I had really just written songs for myself, trying to be a, my own recording artist. Did you ever have dreams and aspirations of actually having a career as a singer? Sure, yeah. sure. For the first decade of my working life as a songwriter and a musician, that's what I wanted to do. I did a couple of solo albums as an artist and I did one uh, sort of progressive rock album with a band I was in called Maxis. You know, the first solo album was around the mid 70s. And, the, and then the band was uh, early 80s. And then my solo album was around 1983 or 84. I, I wanted to do it until I realized that how much more joy I got out of the composing and the design of things as opposed to the performing of them. Um, I liked performing a little bit, but it wasn't where I really lived. And so it took me a while to go, hey, let's uh, make a happy life <laughs> and do things that make me happy instead of, it's not that, that singing made me uh, sad. It's just that I was so hard on myself that it became not enjoyable. I, it was just too, I was just too hard on myself. Uh, and it took the, the joy out of it. But I'd like to come on to talk about the television theme music that you've written with David. His acting, though, was a really strong and important path for him. The Emmy nomination in Police Story, A Chance to Live. After that, there was the, the series Man Undercover. How did the two of you come to write the theme Right. That was very simple. I mean, he came over to my house and said, um, you know, you know, I'm going to be doing a small series. Let's let's write the theme. And I literally sat down at the piano I and mean, we talked about what it was for a while. And there wasn't that much 
discussion. I mean, I just started playing some ideas and, uh, you know, every few minutes he'd go, oh, that, what's that, you know? And then suddenly there was a little chord structure and he started singing over it and we, you know, kept on, and we both had pretty good sense of song form. What's the verse? Is there a B section? What's the chorus? Is there enough time to get to a bridge? Do we need a bridge? Do we, should we do it as a full song? Because we know as a main title theme, it's only going to be probably a minute, maybe in those days, a minute and a half. I don't even remember the length of it, but I mean, I know now, you know, now main title themes are seven seconds or 30 at the most. Um, Los and Clark was 60 seconds, but I think we treated it as a full song and then knew we would have to edit it down to its essence for it to be the, the theme. But Man, it was fun. It was really fun, really fun to do. And it was written fairly quickly. I think we wrote the lion's share of that. Musically, it was finished in that session. And I think there were a few lyrics, uh, though we collaborated on the lyric, um, uh, David did the heavy lifting on it. It was fast. It was a fast process. I forget the producer, the, you know, he had hired a producer, Ken. Ken Mansfield. Ken Mansfield, exactly. So Ken asked me to do sort of the rhythm track arrangement. He hired a, a, a you know an orchestrator to do strings and some of the trombone work and stuff like that. But um, but it was great fun. I, I still remember because it was a really good band playing on that, and I was quite nervous because I played keyboards on it. I was quite nervous just because <laughs> it was really just cream of the crop L.A. session musicians. And that was never really what I was. I mean, I was a songwriter and a, you know, I could play on things I had written. And, but anyway, it, it, it was great fun. It was great fun. And I thought it turned out well. I still, I still am proud of, of it. And I love how he sang it. And just generally a good experience. Other than that, the show, like most things that get made, you know, it's a roll of the dice. You don't know if it's going to go or not. I mean, I remember the the general crit criticism uh, was David Cassidy looks 16. How could, be, how could he be a cop in this, you know? <laughs> that, was, that was one of the sore points, I guess, from critics and so on. That can be a blessing and a curse. Yeah, and as we discussed earlier, that's the pitfall of that yeah. teen idol situation. Mm -hmm. Would you have liked to have written more work with David? That song turned out great. And that was a really, and it was very easy working. Um, so I would have loved that, but it wasn't to be for a couple of reasons. I blasted off into a whole other area of, I got my publishing deal, my first publishing deal ever about around that period, a little later. And I started just focusing on songwriting for other artists. And then David, other than, as I mentioned to you, seeing him socially three or four times over the course of the 80s, I didn't see him after that until I would say the mid 80s, if not 86 or 87. So there was a gap in my seeing him or talking to him, not for anything bad that happened, just life went yeah. this way for us. I think he had a few rough patches then and then you know, built himself up to, you know, the, the next time I saw him uh, and, and hung out with him some, and I'm trying to remember what the context was, was sometime in the, in the 90s. It, I, I forget if it was musically related or not, but it was very warm and, and, and wonderful and as if no time had passed. And he seemed like the same David I knew, which wasn't exactly the same by the time we got to Ruby and the Rockets. But, it, but it, it's a sad point to me that, that reflects that in my um, experience with him, there was, you know, lucid, driven, earnest desire to make good music, David. And then there was a little more lost, David, a little later. The answer to your question is yes, I would have loved to do that, but it just didn't present itself. And then by the time he started doing his own little resurrecting his touring and doing that he had a band together with a music director and was writing his own tunes and that 
And I think, you know, a couple of decades had passed, you know, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't in the phone book to go, oh, let, let me write something with Jay. As great as our experiences were on those couple of projects we did prior, it had been a long time. And um, like I say, no bad blood at all, nothing but good feelings, but um, just, you know, that we, we, we went into two separate universes. And what led to you working on Ruby and the Rockets? I met Sean probably through David. I think Sean had heard my little solo album and I guess liked that I was a recording artist and, and, and just through our mutual friends. Mm -hmm. And I think both Bill Mooney and David Jolliffe were at the heart of that little circle where I met, some, you know. And so I just I just remember that I think it was around 78 at the latest. Um, I got a call from Sean saying, um, you know, he was doing this TV series called The Hardy Boys. And could I put a little band together for the on screen? You know, we weren't actually going to play. And uh, so I put together, you know, a band of some pretty good musicians who all of us ended up going on the on on a couple of his tours when he when he blew up as a as an artist you know and but that's how that's how I met him and then um and then he recorded a song that I wrote on I, I think it was his Born Late record a record called Born Late and then he asked me to write something with him um which I did for either that record or the next record I I, I don't remember um, but um, we just became friends. Now, I, I didn't see him a lot. By the late 80s and 90s, um, we were just, you know, in slightly different worlds. Um, so I didn't see him a lot. And then we reconnected at some point in the mid to late 90s and then have been really close ever since. And aside from um, sort of the mutual love as people and creatives, um, I just hold him in high regard as a family man. His family is incredibly important to him, but he's a wonderful father. And that, um, I got that from David too, but that, that was all, that's really important to me. I have three kids, grown kids. And um, that tells me a lot about someone beyond what their talents or abilities are. And um, I'm drawn, personally drawn to that. I don't remember the exact moment that we met, but um, I was there early in his career. I did one summer tour with Sean, and I remember thinking, oh, this is what the Beatles experienced, because I'm a huge Beatles fan. I don't know who isn't, but um, we did, you know, a summer tour of, you know, 20,000 screaming teenage girl venues, and we didn't hear ourselves. <laughs> so it was an interesting experience. I look back at the concerts where I saw David when I was 13, yeah. 14. Yeah. The fact he didn't play so many Partridge Family songs. That's interesting. More Eric Clapton, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Chicago. Isn't that so interesting? I think that really lets you know where his heart was. And he said, okay, you know, the... That was a character I played, but, but you know, here's a chance for you to see me. Uh, so that, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Fans loved Ruby and the Rockets, and I think it showcased David's incredible, his comedic timing. Patrick and David and Sean, they're all hysterical. I mean, rest in peace, David, but they're, they're, they're all funny. So they're all hysterical. And, and it's, born of, it's born of being smart. Not to say that there weren't, weren't many enough lowbrow comedic moments, but no, I mean, usually things were punny and and satirical and and smart. In fact, so the brotherly dynamic of of the three of them and 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 the and sort of loving put downs, but but familial kinds of put downs. You know, I don't remember it specifically. I just remember the 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 atmosphere of it the the, the first handful of sessions was mainly um when they were doing vocals at my studio were mainly uh, the engineer myself david and patrick 
And then Sean came a couple of times. Everybody had the same goal, which was let's get this to be a, as good as possible. But the road there, because David is, was the most experienced in the room as, as being a recording artist. And so he had his way, he knew what he needed to do to get his vocals and how he wanted to be and how far he wanted to be from the mic. And he knew all that about himself. Um, and, and, and there were some uh, approach things that Sean, I'm, I'm sort of recollecting loosely because I don't have a specific um, moment that I can quote Louise. I mean, you know, that's, that's ice age ago. I just remember being excited that everybody was in a room together and, and collaborating. And I, I always loved the joke of it and the sort of poking fun at themselves. And I took a wonderful picture on the set because I went to the set several times and it was Shirley, Sean, David, and Patrick sitting on a couch on the set in the living room of the set and it was just i just thought you know how often does this happen how often how often does the, is there a you know a, a first family of show business where you see this going on and, and uh and i was just there and i went oh i just have to take you know so i i, I it's a wonderful picture that i love but um the, the, that show you know it, it was silly but, um, you know, the whole idea was to uh, um, sort of poke fun at themselves and the, and the, and the pop, you know, the, especially the 80s pop thing, you know. So it's one of those shows that uh, the powers that be said, that's that, and that was that. And so that would have, that's what would have been nice, I think, about it, ha giving, having been given a little chance to do it a little longer. But everybody... Everybody's a soldier out there and knows that uh, know how knows how it goes. Yeah. What was the brief that you were given to to write the music? Well, I was given a very specific directive. There were two songwriters on the project, and then I was doing whatever little bits of underscoring and connective tissue. But my very specific songwriting job was writing the tongue in cheek '80s songs whereas forget the woman's name who was the other songwriter she was she wrote some of ruby's songs and the more con, sort of more pop contemporary things so i think maybe either of us could have done either but i was you know maybe age appropriate to do the uh to do the 80s things and because there was always a wink in their eye and sort of poking fun at themselves lyrically which Sean and Sean's writing partner wrote all the lyrics. And I think Sean wrote, uh, co-wrote a couple of the music things with me. And then I wrote a few uh, uh, songs musically by myself, but they wrote all the lyrics. And so that's what made it really fun that the lyrics were just ridiculous, you know, and funny and sort of, you know, poking fun at the era and at the and at the, the bloated self-importance of, you know, pop stars and, and such. So, and, you know, they were at my studio doing all those songs and we had laughs and it was also interesting to see the dynamic of the older brother with the younger brother and, and, and uh, you know, Patrick very much looked to David to say, well, is this the right way to do it? And, how, you know, is, you know, and David would correct them. And so it was interesting to see that. I wanted to ask you about the three songs which David sang. Oh, yeah. yeah. Were they written with him in mind? Just oh, yeah, absolutely. But remember that Sean was steering that ship. He was steering the ship lyrically in terms of those songs as the executive producer, as the co-writer of the episodes, as the sort of, you know, as the co-conceiver of what the whole thing was going to be and the whole notion of sort of poking fun at and having tongue deeply in cheek over some of the 80s pop music and the self-involved pop star sort of stereotype. And so there was always going to be a funny wink in its eye 
unknowing, unwittingly self-deprecating, uh, you know, uh, approach to it. And that was highly appealing, but musically to make them hooky and, and as fun as we could. And so, uh, yeah, and I knew from the get-go that the singers were either going to be David or Patrick or both of them. So, so it was very much uh, thought of in that concept by Sean and then my and our job became how to write something that suited the moment that was reasonable representation of an 80s song environment and and then of course you know all the lyrics that he and his partner wrote were, were just always they were just hysterical and goofy and you know so there was always that little tongue in the cheek that that made it fun and everybody was happy to we didn't um not take the recording session seriously we did the best we could on that right that was you know earnestly sung and and you know i mean nothing was like oh let's let's make fun of the process no we we did it as as well as 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 we could but there was the definite design that it needed to also have a you know a, a, a wink in its eye the songs were written first then produced then i produced them uh, in the studio, and then they did, they conceived the video environments, which were so funny. I mean, the, those you know the the platform boots, and I mean, just just a riot. Uh, I I have to give credit to Sean there, because he just uh, you know envisioned so much of this, and and sort of you know got the joke of it all, and everybody was in on the joke. Yes, here are these two guys that were both you know one in a kajillion huge pop stars but they're willing to sort of poke fun at their own stuff you know i mean they they, they took them a couple of shows i think to find their legs under them and 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 relax and of course you know it would have been nice to get at least a second season but it wasn't to be you know as you and i discussed david was in a challenging moment but seemed to overcome it in order to do the work the first time I had seen him before Ruby and the Rockets was at Sean's 50th birthday party. <laughs> and it was great, great to see him. As a matter of fact, I think that uh, him and David Joth and Patrick and me and Bill Moomy, who was, who was a, a friend of everybody's uh, for a long time, um, but everybody that I've just mentioned, you know, we did, we came in my studio and we did some little arrangement of either to do run run or something to sing to him for his her, to Sean for his birthday so it was and David was David was was great yeah. what was it like to reconnect with with David well um it was lovely from the standpoint of it was as if no time had gone by but he was just a little distracted and um not the level of focus that I recalled from years earlier still kind of natural at um, doing his craft and his art, you know, and singing and doing all that. But that was my experience of it. Sadly, I will tell you, sadly. I, I, I saw that I, I got a glimpse into his, his demons. Yeah. So I can't not tell you the, the, the honest truth of, of my experience with that. Clearly yeah. saddened you. And yeah. a lot of people I've spoken to who have said exactly the same thing. Yeah. It just filled them with immense sadness. They all said, I just wish he could have picked up the phone. I wish he'd phoned me or I wish I'd known. Did you feel that way? No, because my relationship with him was never that close. Um, that, that where he would have called me and, sure that he was struggling by the way if that had happened i would have been there for him in a minute i mean it was there was no question but as you and i both know that when it comes to the demon of either drug or alcohol addiction man oh man um i don't know how many people can help with that it's uh you know people have to hit beyond their bottom to make a shift and uh I just think it got the better of him in the end, and uh, it was sad. I saw a little bit of it. I saw a little bit of it. Um, even on that process, I saw some of the concern from both Sean and Patrick. But, you know, 
he was a pro. And when it came time to doing something, he could he could do it. But you you just felt the the struggle and the, and yeah, it's um, not even, not something I necessarily enjoy sharing. But you know, it is it was the it was my experience. You will have happier memories. Well, my my happiest. Well, even even that project itself, even with the with the uh, with the the sadness of some of those experiences especially when he was at my studio that's when i that's when i recognized the most that oh he's he's distracted he's distracted um but even on that he was he was funny and fun and um and enthusiastic and of course you know my older experiences are are the best part because i think that i knew him at his peak um, performance abilities and I don't know clarity, um, and you know there was a couple of decade gap. I saw him maybe three or four times in the eighties at some at a social at somebody's dinner or, or something like that, and that was always great to see him. But I also know that there were times in the eighties where he was very struggled a lot, but you wouldn't know it to have spoken to him. You know he went on a brave face and and uh you know he always figured out that whole family is remarkable in that sense you know low low points like any life like anybody but you know he reinvented and figured it out and then went to broadway and then got a real resurgence with his little las vegas thing and then you know and then started and more touring and you know but he had that demon on his shoulder and um, so, yes, I, I, I choose not even, it does not that much effort. I choose to remember the, the good parts of our relationship because they're easy to remember. And that was, a, that was a little bad blip. Ultimately, I think, you know, it was his biggest demon of his life and challenge, but um, I mostly remember good stuff. How should the rest of the world remember him? That might be too big a question oh. for me, Louise, but I will. I would just say that that people like you and his and his fan base and everything, I think they saw that he was a good soul. He was a good person, and he was both the proud owner and benefactor of that early fame and career, and it was also a, a big albatross. But you know, um, it's always tricky to say, oh, how hard it must have been to be that famous and rich. <laughs> you can't quite, you can't quite have a full, you know, cry over that. <laughs> I think the world sh will and, and should remember him uh, uh, when he was at his most fun loving and best. Well, I suppose it's people like you that, uh, that help make that happen that last couple of years of press and being i don't know arrested and all that crazy stuff you know it's just the, it's just a sad humanistic moment it's not something that would blight his whole output as an artist that's a little moment in time as opposed to a, a whole the whole life he spent trying to do what he did um you know i mean there had been certainly pop stars and teen idol type people before him, but um, he very bravely rebelled against the constrictions of that. You know, I, I kind of honor that. And his whole keeping on trying to entertain and be who he was. So I, I uh, that's what I would hope for. I've loved hearing your story and your connection with, with David. Thank you, likewise, Louise. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. All right, take care, bye. A huge thank you to Jay Guska for sharing his life story and memories of David. So that's it for this week. If you have missed any of the episodes since August 2020, you can find them on all major podcasting platforms. Remember, you can subscribe for free, so you will be among the first to know when new episodes are released. So until we connect,